Well, today I have got this wonderful gentleman sitting in front of me whose name is Steve Travis, and he is the management executive with extensive experience in um, contract catering for military and also higher education. And he has done so much with his life, but he's ex-South African. And uh, I, I'm going to get into how, what he did before he left South Africa, because we are a different generation. And I haven't seen you for maybe 12 years, 14 years, and it's a very long time. And you know what? I can't remember what you did in South Africa before you went to the UK. So let's start that way. How are you, Steve? I'm great, Sandy. Thank you so much. And lovely to see you here and uh, to be here with you and sharing a cup of coffee. Yeah, absolutely. Have you got one sitting next to you? Because I, I do, can. right here. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm <all good. laughs> oh, I can see that you're advertising. All right. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Tell me something. Uh, you were born in South Africa. You grew up there. Um, what when you left school? What did you do there? Well, back in those days, and it was a long time ago, Sandy, we had uh, conscription into the army, yes. and I had six months to kill before finish after finishing school and before I started my army. So I started working in a steakhouse uh, in Santon City, which was part of a chain. Um, no longer exists. This is in Johannesburg, yeah. So we, I worked, uh, started as a busboy in the Longhorn Steakhouse Group and uh, worked my way up until I went through to the army when I was in a management position. And um, that whole passion for catering and customer service and hospitality started there, really. So when you went into the army, uh, did you go in when you went straight into management? When, when, when I came out of the army, I went straight into management and I eventually bought my own steakhouse franchise. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where my career then developed from there. I didn't know that. And that was yeah. where? In South Africa? In Rudaput. Yeah, in, in Rudaput in South Africa. Right. And I was there until I left South Africa in 1992. Okay, okay. And then you came to England to do what? Did you have a um, same, too? same thing. I was actually, I, I ran a restaurant in Covent Garden on arrival in, South, in London. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, my career moved with various companies. So I was involved with the Old Orleans Restaurant Group, uh, then had a hotel down in Cornwall for around 11 years, uh, where my kids were born and where they still live. And um, I got into contracting down in Cornwall at the Royal Naval Air Station and got into contract catering with them and uh, worked for a large American company and working with them and the exposure to the volumes that we were doing in the naval base uh, gave me experience to go on to bigger and better opportunities within the company. And that led to me ultimately going out to the Olympic Games in Beijing. I, 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 you're, you're running away from me because <laughs> the reason I really wanted to speak to you today was to hit upon the Olympic Games um, because Japan is just about to start. I think it's the 25th of um, July, somewhere around right. there. But let's, let's go back a little bit. Sure. You were in Cornwall. Uh, you were doing contract catering in the UK. And yes. how it was management executive position in your own company? Yes. Okay. So it was, uh, it was running all aspects of catering, retail, and leisure within the military base. Aha. Uh -huh. um, because a, a lot of the services by the military are contracted out to contract caterers. Okay. So we worked alongside military personnel as well as civilian personnel to deliver high street concepts on the naval base. So we would bring uh, partnerships that we developed with uh, high street brands into the naval base, as well as running the military messes so the officers mess, the junior ranks mess, and the senior rates mess, uh, where we would feed them 
in their actual environment. We would cater for all of their functions, for the summer balls, for the traditional mess dinners and all the rest of it. So it was a fantastic experience. Unbelievable. And when you, uh, did you have to tender for everything? Um, the tenders were run by the company. Obviously, they tendered, they tendered for the contracts. And then when we won them, they were generally between five and seven year contracts uh -huh. and then they go through reiterations and you know things have changed so much in terms of the contracting to the military in the last five years so it's quite interesting uh how did you no, okay i'm going to restart which was the first contract you got for an olympic games which was the first olympic games that you and your company were contracted to do the first Olympic Games was back in the 1940s that the company got. Um, my first Olympic Games was 2008. And so it was... Uh, that was Beijing? That was Beijing. And it was part of the, the legacy with the company who have catered for every Summer Olympics since they started catering them. So uh, quite a big, uh, quite big kudos for the company, really. Absolutely. Tell me what it's like to cater for an Olympic Games. What does it entail? Because the sports people have all got various diets. Um, there are, they've got thousands and thousands and thousands of meals to think about over, it's usually a two week period, is that correct? Yeah. Or you go into it anyway. So just give me yeah. an idea what a day to day uh, would be like for you and your team. Well, interestingly, the actual running of the day to day during those two key weeks yeah. um, is the culmination of three and a half years work. So when you start tendering for an Olympic Games, you're starting three years beforehand um, and you're you've got to do everything from the design and the build of the actual dining room, right the way through, through security, through logistics, supply chain, making sure that everything that's coming onto the uh, onto Olympic Park is safe for the athletes. The last thing you want is to have a food poisoning outbreak when these guys are at their peak of their performance and they, they're cut down because of a bug. Um, it's around the recruitment of up to three and a half thousand staff that you need to help run that operation. Um, when, when you go live, we actually go live two or three weeks before the Olympics because you have a lot of international athletes arriving to acclimatize. So you're operational a month before and you're obviously operational a month afterwards because we have the Paralympics that come after a week's break after the Olympics, and then we have the Paralympics in two weeks. So it's, um, yeah, it's fascinating. It's certainly the biggest peacetime catering operation in the world. Um, operationally, we can have anything up to 60, 70,000 people a day coming through the dining room. The dining room's open <laughs> 24 hours a day. And um, athletes can eat anything they want at any time of the day or night. And to your point, you know, you've got thousands of competitors, all with different dietary requirements. Um, probably 18 months before the games start, we actually send all of our menus out to all of the coaches from all of the countries around the world, usually around 200 countries. And they plan the athlete diet and menu for the day for the whole time that they're in the Olympic venue. And every single dish has its full nutritional values. Um, every time we put it out on the counter, the nutritionals are actually displayed so they can see exactly what's in that dish and whether it suits their diet or not. And of course, 200 countries, you have to cater for so many different tastes. Yeah. And um, the, the way we approach that is we basically split it north, east, south and west. Uh, or, you know, we create zones that specialize in cuisine from that area. 
So you would have uh, the European European area, and you would have an Asian Indonesian area, and you would have African Caribbean and Halal. Um, and you know, then there was Chinese specialist areas when we were in in Beijing. Um, so, and then there is familiar food to every athlete from his home country, so they can identify exactly what they're looking for. Right, and calories are also mentioned in all the food. Um, calories, fat, energy levels, sugar, salt, the whole lot. Everything. Yeah. Everything and do every you, single dish. Do you take your own team with you and then pick up uh, people while you're there? How 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 do you work with staffing of the chefs and uh, sous chefs and things like that? So what we do with the company is we we bring in our senior chefs and senior management from contracts around the world. So the company I worked for was an American company. So we had a lot of experienced people that had done the previous games. So they understood how it operated. And then we tended to employ local people. And so it's part of the ongoing Olympic legacies is that you want to try and instill new skills to locals. So in China, we partnered with a number of universities who then sent us their hospitality students who were all fluent in English. So the hospitality students, because I don't speak Chinese, our hospitality students were our translators. And then when we had something to get across to the team, we would say it and the hospitality translators would then translate it to the rest of the team. So obviously being in China with the Chinese cuisine being such a big feature, we had a lot of Chinese chefs working for us. Um, probably 650 Chinese chefs. Wow. And um, the remaining team of about another 2,900, 3,000 were all locals. Um, with a management team in Beijing of about 200. But we were spread across everywhere in Beijing because at the Beijing Games, the company I worked for did all the catering. So it was not only the athletes, it was the officials, it was um, the press. Um, you know, so it, the only thing we didn't handle was the outside hospitality. Yeah. That, was a, that was just amazing. And look how you then... Uh, incorporated the youth to start learning in such an area that they would never have been given the opportunity if the games had not been there and if the country oh. had not been. It, it just, it changed their lives as well. A hundred percent. And, you know, I think the whole ethos, not only of the Olympics, but the way we operate is that we want to develop the future, the people of the future, and um, yeah, I'm still in touch with a lot of my team that I worked with in 2008 because they gained so much benefit from working with us. And I enjoy so much sharing experience and opportunities with my teams. Um, and that, that's the way we, we see it in moving forward is, you know, you lead by example, you give them the best opportunity that they can have. And um, they either grasp it or they don't. And pleased to say, most of them have grasped it. Which is lovely. The picture that uh, I'm seeing behind you, can you explain that to me? Because it looks to me like London, but because I've been away for so long, uh, I don't know your background uh, behind you. So please tell me what it is. You have been away for too long, Sandy. Um, <laughs> no, never too long. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is London, but not a part I think you'd recognise. So behind me is the Olympic Village for ah. London 2012. So all, all the blocks of flats uh, were all the accommodation and the new Stratford International Station right there. Um, and yeah, that was the main Olympic Village. Uh, for London 2012, I'm not sure if you can see that nice big rectangle up there. Yes, yes, I can. What's that? that rectangle is uh, a 100 meter wide by 300 meter long dining room. What? 
That is the athletes dining for London 2012 at Stratford. Wow. So you, you did the, Olymp the Olympics there in 2012 as well. Uh, there again, you only used um, UK chefs and staff and did you bring people in from other countries as well as uh, translators as you did in Beijing? Well, we, we used local to the five local boroughs to the Olympic villages where we employed all of our staff from. Uh -huh. In London, we had uh, three and a half thousand staff and 256 managers. And our management team came from around the world with the same company. Uh, a lot of them were first time Olympians, uh, as we call ourselves, because we are part of the Olympic uh, journey. Yeah. And we help those uh, champions become champions. Um, but uh, about a third of them had had previous games experience. London was very different to um, our Beijing operation in terms of the look and feel of the dining room. It was laid out differently. We created pods and zones which were really exciting. And then on the main entrance, of course, the biggest pod in the middle of the whole dining room was the best of British, um, because we're now in London and we sure. need to celebrate British food. The home and A hundred percent. And, you know, it was lovely showcasing the British food because we, we used local suppliers and we used suppliers from all around Britain, be it um, sourdough from Tower Hamlets that's cooked in brick ovens with peat from the Thames, or Welsh lamb, or uh, charcuterie from Perthshire. So it was very much uh, a local feel and flavor to the games. Yeah, that's absolutely wonderful to hear. Uh, was vegan uh, around at that time? It, it, it was around. Um, vegan's actually been in, well, it was in Beijing that I experienced in Beijing, uh, as well as London. Uh, you know, you, you have to cater for all dietary requirements, be it halal or kosher um, or veganism, vegetarianism. So the, the menus are very, very broad. 13 to 1700 different menu dishes that go out on the counter over the course of the two weeks. And you're, as contractors, we're not allowed to repeat the same dish day after day. So it has, to, it has to be an eight-day rolling cycle. Um, so it's a different dish every breakfast, every lunch, every dinner for eight days before we go back into the first week cycle. And uh, what about the parties afterwards? What were they like? They were fantastic. Um, when you know, you've got you won, for instance, and became a gold medalist, were you involved with that at all? Or was that yeah. too much between just, I call them the kids, just between the kids and you didn't get involved in that area? You become involved by proxy. Um, the, di the dining room is an area where these athletes come to fuel themselves. So some athletes eat five or six times a day. And, you know, it just depends on the calorific intake that they have to take. So rowers, eight and a half thousand calories a day they consume. You know, weightlifters, 10 or 12,000 calories. So you, you become a part of their experience and you're there rooting for them when they're competing. <clears throat> Excuse me. But once they've won and uh, they've got their medal and everything calms down and they come back to the dining room, to fuel up for their next competition, they will come in with their medal around their neck because quite rightly, they're proud to be wearing it. Absolutely. And it's the athletes that are in the dining room all applaud them and all congratulate them. And when they come up to the counter, the staff tell, you know, congratulate them. Or when they're walking past you, you high five them. Um, I was really lucky at the uh, end of the swimming at London 2012, uh, Michael Phelps had won a number of medals again, um, the American swimmer, and he came into the dining room with the medal around his neck, and I said, you know, well done, great to see you again, 
I said, that another gold medal. And he took it off and he just handed it to me and he said, yep, that's what it's like. Uh, and, and he just... And you he felt it? You held it and you felt it? Oh, I was holding his gold medal while he went through the counter to get himself something to eat. Oh, how wonderful. And then I put it back down on his tray and he went down, pulled his hoodie up and he had his <laughs> dinner. It was wonderful. <laughs> uh, I've got one question to ask, which um, I actually... This came about when I was talking to a medical man here, and you may or may not be able to uh, answer me. I, I wondered why there were, there have not been any black uh, Olympic swimmers, black skiers. I know that at the last games, the tobogganists were from uh, the Caribbean. And I just wondered why we don't have, because it's not an expensive sport. If you're talking about a sport, say golf or, or tennis or whatever, those can be expensive. But you don't see the black people as swimmers. And I want to know why. Can you I, answer that? Have you, have you come across any in your times of doing uh, Olympic Games? I, I have come across all nationalities in all sports. Yeah. Um, it's quite often it's not, it, it's not recognized because the guys are not the gold or silver medalists that everybody gets to know and they don't become the household names. Um, it could be down, and I, I really don't know about the skiing or the, the Winter Olympic sports, but it may be down to the development of grassroots within countries around the yeah. world, whether they're encouraging people into sport or not. And, uh, you know, if we just take a, a total side on South African rugby, um, there's a lot of grassroots development going on there which is why we get all nationalities and all races coming through the sport yeah. other than that i i, I don't as have in, uh, as in football i mean you know everything has changed and today 2021 everything is going to change and i just wonder for the uh olympics in japan uh as i said i think it's the 25th of july that it is starting i wonder if we will see any unknown names who are who are black black people uh, because they are now so much to the fore and why shouldn't they be? Hundred percent. I mean, there's, there's great representation from all races in most sports. Um, you know, you've picked up on swimming. hundred percent. You know, there's not a raft of. Uh, multinational or multi-racist competitors within uh, swimming itself but there are certainly in everything else uh you know in in every other competitor sport in the games okay well uh, as a female has just become the first jockey to win the grand national i mean females are also going to come into it anyway a hundred percent we have now covered about the olympic games now i want to go further along uh, I know at some stage you were very involved with Blenheim Palace, and I don't know how, and I don't know why, and I don't know when, and I don't know. <laughs> so answer my question, how did you get involved in that? So when I was coming to the end of London 2012, a, uh, a previous uh, boss of mine who I'd worked with in the military contacted me and he said I've got a perfect contract for you to run uh, I think it will really excite you it's right up your street and that turned out to be Blenheim Palace so uh, when I had my a very rare day off from the Olympics I shot out to Oxfordshire I had a look around the palace I looked around all the catering and events uh, facilities there and I uh, joined um, the team at Blenheim Palace in November 2012. And um, it was also contracted catering. So we looked after all the day visitor catering. The, uh, we did weddings in the orangery, in the palace itself. We did pop-ups out on the, uh, 
out in the gardens and in the grounds when they had events like the triathlon or flower show or, you know, big events where we have thousands of visitors coming in. And, um, yeah, that, that was just, it was absolutely wonderful working for Blenheim Palace. I love the place. I love the people. It was um, wonderful working with the family because the family were very involved, well, are still very involved in what happens at Blenheim Palace because it is still effectively their home. Yeah. And um, I, I miss Blenheim a lot. It, for me, it was four years that I had with Blenheim Palace. It was extremely long days, nights, weekends. And I don't regret one second of it. It was just the most wonderful experience. And are you allowed to mention uh, which members of the royal family that you actually got to meet? Or is that uh, not to be discussed? <laughs> Oh, no, you, 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 meet, you meet a lot of people from a lot around the world. But at the Olympic Games, you know, you get to meet heads of state, sure. um, uh, which was, fan for me, my, my highlight in London, apart from seeing the Queen and uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, was actually meeting Her Serene Highness Charlene, Princess Charlene of Monaco, and Prince Albert. Well, she and, is uh, South African. She, she is South did, African. Did you speak to her in Africa? I did actually, <laughs> and she was very taken aback. No, we, uh, I thought you would. <laughs> yeah, no, we we had we had, we had a, a lovely chat. We had a really good time, and uh, she came in during the Paralympics, and um, she asked me where the South African Paralympic team was, and she went over to see them as well. So that was lovely. And then through working with the military, I met Princess Anne a couple of times. She's the uh, commander of the naval of the navy. Yeah. Uh, commander in chief of the navy, and um, yeah, at Blenheim I met a number of people, which was uh, which was wonderful as well. Now, uh, all that takes up virtually twenty four hours of your day, seven days a week, and there comes a stage in your life when you stop to think, I've got a family, I've got a wife, I've got to have a life. Uh, what is that? What made you decide to leave Blenheim and? 24-7, all those days, all those weeks a year? Whilst I have absolutely no regrets of my time at Blenheim, I got to a stage in my, my life that I felt my work-life balance needed to take priority. Um, work had been a priority for so many years, and I'd given so much back to the industry and I felt that I could utilize the skills that I've learned over the last 40 years in this business um, elsewhere. And um, an opportunity came up for me to move into the higher education university sector, oh. which, which again is, uh, is wonderful because you're dealing with 18 to 24 year olds mm. who are pretty much the same demographic as most of your military personnel. Um, you have on campuses anything between six and 22,000 students. So it's high volume again. And um, generally, the catering operations in the position I'm in now um, is Monday to Friday. I have most evenings off to myself and weekends. So every weekend feels like a mini holiday to me now, where I haven't had them for years. So in the summertime, it's barbecue time <clears throat> for you, which is absolutely magic. Uh, just going back to the university, um, with the situation that we're in and have been in, <clears throat> excuse me, for more than a year, how has that affected the catering and the university students uh, with COVID being around? Because a lot of them have been working from home. So that has changed demographics for you as far as the numbers. A hundred percent. I mean, I think, you know, the pandemic's affected everybody around the world. The students have had to learn how to study online. Um, but fortunately, at the campus that I, I work at is uh, around 4,000 students accommodated on campus. Mm -hmm. At the start of COVID, um, with everything shut down and nobody could go anywhere, 
my team and I came in every day. We were catering um, for the students and delivering food to their accommodation blocks. And um, everything is done in terms of health and well-being, mindfulness. We work very closely with the, um, the mental health team at the university and um, we interact directly with them. So we've had to step up and change the way we operate very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, our cash sales in a lot of our outlets is down by 87, 88%. And we've only got a couple of outlets open. Normally I have 14 outlets open on campus. I've only got three open on campus at the moment because we just don't have the volume of people through here. We've got all of the university staff who are also working from home. So footfall's very low, but what it's given us time to do is take stock of the way we operate our business. And in a very short space of time, we have developed a fully functional app which is used across the whole of campus now. You can be in your accommodation block, you can be outside a cafe, you can order click and collect food, you can order food for delivery, you can order meal kits that you, you get sent to your, to your accommodation that has all the ingredients for you to cook a meal at home uh, or in your flat with your, your flatmates who are all isolating together. We had self-isolation kits for students who were ill so we could deliver them a hot meal to outside their door, knock on the door and leave, and that student could retrieve their meal and get a breakfast, lunch or dinner every day. So, you know, it's, it's been a, a period of fast development, a total turnaround in operations, but anyone listening to you that's in hospitality who has worked in a restaurant or a bar or a cafe, knows that in this industry you just bend and twist and roll with it every single every single time so we've just adapted everything that we do to help the students on site yeah. excuse me the, uh, you've adapted with the modern technology of apps which is absolutely incredible uh five years ago ten years ago had we had this situation it would never have been able to have worked this way no, we, we wouldn't have. And, you know, I think the thing is that once you get, it, it all starts with understanding your customer base. And um, we do a lot of research into our student demographic and Generation Z and how Generation Z lives and how they work and how they interact with technology. You know, they spend on average four and a half hours a day on their phone. And they have an eight second attention span when it comes to a video. So, you know, you've got to get your messages across pretty quickly if you want to capture their imagination. And by, by understanding all that insight is what helped us develop the app accordingly. Well, I want to tell you, Steve Travis, I have learned so much about you today. <laughs> I thought I knew you, but really, I didn't know a, a, an eighth of you. And I just want to say thank you so much for all the information, for allowing me in and my viewers to find out how the Olympics work, how the university works, how you work. And I'm just so happy to know that now you've got a proper life. And you are- Oh, so Sandy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sandy. It's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Absolutely. You take care and be safe and stay well. And Likewise. to my viewers, I say, Thank you for watching. Uh, I hope that you have found it as interesting as I have and found Steve Travis as knowledgeable as I have found him to be. And I look forward to seeing you again next time for a cup of coffee with me, Sandy. In the meantime, take care, stay well, and be safe. Bye-bye.